Was there an Adam? Was there an Eve? Or did we evolve from what we conceived? Either way, we got what... Hey, everybody, this is Harvey Sluggo Wasserman, back for the, uh, I guess it's the 113th Zoom call of the Grassroots Green, Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition Zoom calls, otherwise known as the GREEP or the GREEGREE Gree, to all of you in uh, New Orleans. Uh, we have an incredibly full agenda, as always. Welcome to our guests at the Progressive Radio Network. Um, uh, it's just always a joy to see all these beautiful, wonderful people uh, on my screen. Um, and by the way, just for those who, who care, uh, I, I have a new screen. I got a, finally got an Apple, uh, um, a MacBook Air, because I go back and forth between California and Teaneck, New Jersey. And for those of you who care, I'm in Teaneck, New Jersey uh, right now uh, for the Jewish holiday of Sukkot visiting my 13, count them, 13 grandchildren. So as you might be well aware, this is not a meeting of the zero population growth uh, uh, organization. Uh, we've got 48 people with us and our um, agenda today is packed as always. We're gonna, uh, when she joins us, we're gonna hear from Kristen Nunez, the president of the National Organization for Women. Uh, she is going to uh, update us on um, the uh, impacts of Roe v. Wade and other um, issues having to do with women and, and this election. Um, and uh, a leader, Wendy Lederman has just joined us. She will also talk about the impact of women. We want to um, um, uh, defer in the beginning here to all women uh, to talk about uh, their impact. Uh, on the election. So uh, please, uh, guys, just hold your hand uh, down until we uh, move into that, move through that. Um, uh, we are then going to be joined with Joel Siegel, uh, who was just in Puerto Rico at a major international conference and give us a report on, on that, um, uh, at, at that conference as well. As the uh, state of uh, Puerto Rico having been hammered by its second major, major uh, windstorm in uh, just a couple of years, uh, not, not, not even through rebuilding from the last one, and they're hammered by another one. Those of you who don't believe in global warming may want to go to a, a different call. And Wendy, um, after talking to us about women's rights, will also update us on the physical situation in Florida. Um, I do want to start um, at the top of the second hour, um, which will be six o'clock Eastern time, three o'clock Pacific. Uh, we are going to go uh, with a full hour on energy and um, uh, the uh, attempt of California to kill solar energy and our attempt to kill Diablo Canyon, kind of a, a, a back and forth. And uh, we have Tatanka Bricka um, uh, and uh, many, many others from California. I appear to have a dark side here in my picture, but uh, that's cool. I'm sitting with my laptop, and uh, and this is new. So, uh, but we we um, uh, we're up to 53 people, and we will continue to rise. Uh, it is a great thing to have all of you with us. It's a great thing to be joined by our friends on the Pacific on the uh, Progressive Radio Network. And uh, I'm going to start with very quickly and, and surprise uh, Tatanka Bricka because this is Indigenous Peoples Day as it turns out. So uh, while we wait to be joined by Christian Nunez and jump in on women's issues, uh, this is, uh, what is it, 500 and some years since Christopher Columbus uh, desecrated uh, the um, island of, I guess it was it's Santa Domingo, where he landed. And we do want to celebrate uh, our indigenous uh, kin. Um, and, you know, I got to say, as a historian, I have read many, many books um, I haven't written any to say this, many, many books that's, that mourn the passing and the extinction of the indigenous. But you know what? <laughs> it didn't happen. Uh, like Mark Twain's uh, line about, you know, the notices of his death uh, are premature. Uh, the indigenous are with us very, very much. Uh, Tatanka Bricka, can you briefly uh, honor us 
with a couple of words about Indigenous Peoples Day. You work, of course, with the very, very powerful uh, tribes and um, uh, the indigenous are incredibly powerful in this country after all they've been through. It's remarkable when you think about it. And we also want to mention, by the way, uh, I want to mention this now uh, so we don't lose track of it. Uh, we want to thank Joe Biden for pardoning about 6,500 federal um, pe people who were convicted of federal marijuana crimes uh, of possession. 6,500 is the tip of the iceberg, but it's, it's something, and they are pushing to legalize pot uh, uh, nationwide. And since he's in a pardoning mood, I think we should all really give a, a push and a shout that he finally pardoned Leonard Peltier. Um, maybe he'll do it at Thanksgiving. Yeah. That would be appropriate, I assume. But any day further that Leonard Peltier stands in prison is what we call in the Cherokee language, a Shonda. So, um, 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 Tatanka, do you want to say a couple words about Indigenous Peoples Day before we go on to women's issues, please? Sure. Um, wherever I go and there's working people uh, this today, I've mentioned that I'm in a Motel 6 outside of Sacramento. <laughs> and um, there's a guy from India and a guy from Colombia that worked the desks. They're both aware that it's Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, what to say? Well, first, I think you and I mentioned this. I, I will try to get Rex Weiler. We should get Rex Weiler on the call. He wrote a book on Leonard. And um, Rex is a fellow draft resistor at the last minute, decided to go to Canada. He had some indigenous blood in him and uh, called me in 69 and said he's working on a peace group. I said, what are you doing? He said, we're making um, music to see critters underwater. And I, I didn't know what to make of it. And he called me three months later and he said, open the San Francisco Chronicle. And there was the first picture of Rex's shot of, of Greenpeace up against the Japanese whalers in the, in the little, you know, the little boat, the little inflatable. Um, I had a dream three, four weeks ago about truth. I, I've been asking for information on what to do about truth and reconciliation with the, uh, in the old Catholic language, the original sin of the people of this country the immigrants from Europe, which is the decim near decimation of the indigenous people, uh, not successful. Um, and so before I mention a dream coming to me, I do want to mention that Roe v. Wade, as Danny Sheehan talks about, opens the door. It's a roundabout way for the, for the long-term goal of, of the powers that be in this country which is to deny the indigenous people of Turtle Island their autonomy and their land on their reservations. The, it's that suit out of Texas having to do with um, the right of a white family to adopt a native kid who has been denied to go to their own culture because now they are full deserving of full rights of U.S. citizenship, but not, you know, to be a separate nation. And that's the first that will probably end up with the Supreme Court. Of course, the goal is to take back all the land, to get at the uranium, to get at all the raw materials, and to finish the job of the extinction of the culture, because the, the overall goal was integration into the melting pot of American society. Anyway, the first, the first step on truth and reconciliation, uh, my dream, I saw tribes and I was working on both the Lakota and the Pomo and the uh, Noyo reservations, gathering in prayer bundles, the original treaty, that local area, the date, time, place, and all the details, and then all the details about the breaking of that treaty. And I think it would not be a bad idea if we had in every local area, every tribe on Turtle Island gathering that information, and then people can inform themselves locally because truth and reconciliation depends on truth first. 
to reconcile and to make atonement. And I think the most moving part of Standing Rock for many people was when the vets came and basically went down on a knee and atoned for the violation of the rights of the Native American people, of the indigenous people of Turtle Island. So that's what I look forward to. I look forward to a local, national, global at one minute, which starts with truth before reconciliation and the truth that we all live on stolen land if we are not indigenous to this culture. Thank so, you for that, uh, uh, Tatanka, beautifully spoken. And I do want to remind people on Indigenous Peoples Day that when the whites came to North America uh, to civilize the, the heathens, they encountered what was in fact the most sophisticated and most advanced democracy in the history of the world, which was the Iroquois Confederacy. And the Iroquois Confederacy was founded either somewhere between 1140 and 1540. We're not exactly sure. And uh, the, the principal male was a guy named Daganawida, who was either a person or a spirit, who spoke through um, a, an order named uh, Hiawentha. But the reconciliation, and it was a complex story, but the reconciliation that led to the formation of the most advanced democracy in the world, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, was done by a woman named Jagansase. She was the first matriarch, and she combed the snakes from the hair of the war chief Tadodaho. And uh, all democracy in North America, anything that has a small d democracy in our constitution and in our modern culture, comes from the indigenous. The indi most of the indigenous tribes in North America were matriarchies. And, and most of them were extremely democratic in terms of social. Nobody, uh, uh, nobody starved in a, in a Native American, uh, in an indigenous society, unless everybody was starving. There was no class system. There were, there were divisions and so on and so forth. And also by and large, virtually all the tribes and nations of North America um, had no problem with uh, uh, LGBTQ issues. It was, or with abortion for that matter. Um, so anybody wants more of it, uh, um, uh, my book is uh, The People's Spiral of U.S. History. You can write me at solartopia at gmail and I'll send you a free PDF. But of course there will be a quiz and you'll be required to read it. But nonetheless, we need to honor uh, our indigenous roots, and we need to ask um, uh, Joe Biden to please do what Bill Clinton and Barack Obama did not have the good sense to do. Please free Leonard Peltier. Please do that. And, uh, and we all need to send him messages and strength and, and whatever to make sure that finally happens, for God's sakes. Uh, we're joined by Ray McClendon. Uh, Ray will talk in a bit about uh, uh, Atlanta I, I, and, and Georgia. Uh, I have heard a rumor that uh, Herschel Walker has formed a football team of children of his that he never met, but uh, we'll have to ask you about that later. We want to start. We are joined by Kristen Nunez, and I know that, Joel, you are just with her. If you can say a few words about Christian and then turn it over to Wendy Lederman and to Christian Nunez, we want to start our program uh, today talking about women's rights and women's issues in this election. And then we will segue over because I know, Joel, you were just in Puerto Rico with Christian and we'll talk about the hurricane there. And Wendy will uh, chime in also with um, uh, the, the report from Florida. And then in the second hour, we're going to jump in uh, with both feet on um, energy and environmental issues. Uh, Christian, it's great to see you. Uh, Joel, if you want to do an intro with Wendy uh, to Christian Nunez, that would be wonderful. And then we will prioritize women speaking uh, on this issue, please. Okay, hi everyone. Um, well, it's evening where I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, but um, I met Christian Nunez, by the way, through this broadcast, through um, the group. So thank you, Harvey and Steve, you know, and Mike, because without this 
broadcast, I, I would have never met Christian Nunez. So Christian is the uh, president of the National Organization of Women. She was also the keynote speaker at the, at the conference, which, um, which I think is pretty cool. Um, she has three master's degree. Um, she's the first African-American woman from the National Organization of Women to be president literally in decades. Um, I, I think she's one of the, you know, I am biased, but she's one of the greatest leaders that, in America, but she's also a, a great of a leader that she is. She's an incredible strategist. And, uh, and she's also uh, probably one of the nicest persons that I've ever met in my life. And um, so I'm, I'm, without further ado, um, you know, Christian Nunes. And, and with Wendy here, Wendy, Christian. Oh, oh Wendy. Wendy. <laughs> it's okay, Wendy, and we wanna, this is, a, this is gonna be a women's uh, half hour. So yes. go ahead, uh, Wendy and Christian, you're gonna take it away for us on women's rights. Well, thank you so much. And, and Wendy, it's wonderful to share the space with you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank you. Uh, yeah. But, um, and thank you so much, Joel, always. <laughs> it's always uh, wonderful. And Harvey, it's great to see you as well. And so many, Likewise. and Tatanka, and so many other faces that I see on there um, that I don't see right now, but I know you're in the audience. Um, it's always great to be back. Um, yeah. So I think one of the first things I would start off by saying is Roe is on the ballot you know, for the midterms. Um, and when I say that it's going to be on ballots in multiple states, but it is really more than about the overturning of Roe. It's really about saving women's lives and young girls' lives. And, and when I say women, I'm being inclusive in my statement when I say women. So we wanted to talk about that. Um, and I think it's super important that we understand that what's happening with these abortion bans are far more than just trying to control um, personal, like reproductive <laughs> uh, freedom. Um, this goes way beyond that. And this is a strategy that extremists are using to regain, to increase their power and control and really truthfully revert back in some old ways the constitution was originally written. Um, and it's just the, the gateway for them to continue to move from one group to the next. So I think we should really just kind of frame our conversation by that <laughs> um, because this is what we're seeing, you know, when we see what's happening and what they're doing in the states as a result of the bans, the tax they're trying to do, it's not just, you know, what they're saying they're doing, that's what's the most interesting thing I would talk about is pro-life argument which I believe they're anti-choice. I don't call them pro-life. And the reason why we, we strictly say this is because when you're pro-life, you're about everyone's life, right? So everyone has the same equity, same value, the same worth. But in this movement, what we're seeing, even with the bans, is that it's not everyone's equity. It's not everyone's value. It is targeted to really create more oppression, more disharmony, more imprisonment, more slavery, on certain groups of people. So I want to ask for us to call it out like we see it. Um, instead of us just saying that this is only about reproductive right and about abortion care and access, it goes far beyond this in what we're seeing happening. We have states going back and reverting bills back to 1864 before they were even formalized states, <laughs> you know? So we have to really talk about what we're seeing and how this impacts not only, you know, those who can become pregnant, but also families you know, in our communities, in our mass incarceration rates, in the maternal mortality rate, and access to health care, and economic injustice. It affects everyone. And if we want to sit around and pretend like and be disconnected and say that I don't need to vote on this ballot measures, or I don't need to consider these things or think about these things, um, then we really need to reconsider our advocacy. <laughs> and our activism, because this has to be an intersectional movement right now, especially if you plan on saving lives. And if you have anyone in your life uh, that could be directly impacted by this, this is a time that we get out and really truly educate. I'm gonna switch it over to Wendy. Well, thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure to just hear you speak and you have just such a wonderful energy of thank having you. you on. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you really um, hit it right there when you said it's not about pro-life because if it was pro-life then you know, we would have um, more social services once the children are born. They wouldn't be starving. They they wouldn't be, you know, there'd be um, 
you know, housing and foster care that was equitable. And, you know, again, with, with slavery, like you said, with the mass incarcerations, this is, I mean, we have private prisons, it's for profit, you know, and we have just a completely dismantled system that really harvests humans, you know, for, for having them fill the beds and do the work that they do. And this is just another way to control. And, um, and, and it goes beyond, you know, it's like, what's the old thing where they say, oh, first they came for the women, for, then they came, you know, it, it affects everybody there. You know, women are, are physically less, have less strength than men. So we, I believe we, we get, you know, targeted for certain types of bullying. So it's, it's a test to see how far they can go and who else they can push to just take over this minority rule to have control over everyone. And, um, and, and kind of going back to the work that, that Christian does, um, I'm, I'm kind of reminded of just with um, the work with the progressive era and 100 years ago, granted, there was still a lot of segregation even within the women's movements. And um, hopefully we've come a lot further with that. But um, the women were, were hugely instrumental in a lot of the changes that we see now, like labor rights, child um, labor, um, workforce, social services, and um, so I think that we could um, see a, a big push. You know, I, I wanted to bring up a statistic. There was um, Brookings Institute um, did. So I'll put it in the chat, but they they reported on a lot of studies. And in Kansas City, with the, the ballot measures that mm -hmm. Christian mentioned, on um, there's um, some in um, Michigan now, and there's another one in um, Kentucky. And so, um, yeah, and in, in uh, Kansas, we, um, we saw earlier that they were trying to put an abortion ban on the ballot in the primaries, and 69% of new voters registered were women, and, and it was like record breaking. So the motivation is there. Um, I think that part of it, too, is, is people feeling like they are fr enfranchised to vote and going to be able to vote. But um but yeah, I mean, women definitely are um, a huge force and that's probably part of the reason they're trying to control us as well. And I'll bounce it back to Christian now, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Wendy. And and Wendy nailed it when you think about majority of the voters, majority of the voters support a woman's right to choose. They support and see um, reproductive care, access, abortion care, all as part of healthcare as a human right. But when we come down to it, we also see trucks that they're playing, right, Wendy? What these, what even what they tried to do in Michigan when they collected more than the record number of signatures, right? Power of the people we're talking about here, and then they tried to find some loophole with language to try to, to you know, try to prevent them from putting on the ballot. And it wasn't until the people pushed back and says, "Oh no, we're not having this." you're going to put this on the ballot and they were bringing the force that they finally said, Oh, okay, we'll go ahead and let it on the ballot. So this is what we're up against. You know, we're up against, you know, essentially a group of people, a very small percentage of our, um, of Americans who are running this country um, who don't want a democracy. They want an oligarchy, right? Let's call Let's talk about it. And because they want to keep it, democracy is a collective power of the people. Everyone has a decision in voting. Everybody has a right to be contribute, um, their, you know, in power. And this is what we're trying to keep going for. This is what we've been pushing for for our whole entire history in this country. But we've had a small group of people who've been running this country who are trying to push for the opposite. And that's what they're trying to do right now, right? They're trying to make it so difficult for people to vote. They're making it illegal for people to vote that the people that can have access or the people who are the ones that are manipulating the power don't want to see women as human, whole humans. They want to see LGBTQ as having whole humans as rights. They don't want to see people of color as having whole humans and rights. They don't want to have the immigrants as whole humans rights. And I think there's this humanness that we are fighting for as well. And that's the recognition that we are all valid, we are all worthy, we are all purposeful, and we all deserve to be recognized for our full wholeness and humanness. And they're trying to tell us opposite. So this is part of the reason why we have to push so hard. And the, the victory in those states and, and, you know, showed us that if we collectively organize together on a unified goal, right, stepping outside of our silos, <laughs> and we operate on a unified goal to accomplish something, and it's okay if we come from different backgrounds, different movements, that's, it's all about social justice, it's all about human and civil rights, 
that's our common goal, right? We're all fighting for our human civil rights. If we come together and we say, okay, this is what we have to do to make sure, because like women, women are turning up, women are pissed, women are mad as hell, <laughs> and women are turning up because they're like, you're no longer going to tell me that I'm not whole and I'm not human. And you're no longer going to dictate for me. Like you've been trying to dictate for however, but you think about it, we're still trying to get them to actually enshrine the Equal Rights Amendment, right? Even though we, if all the qualifications have been met, everything's been done that they said needs to be done. They still do not want to protect women under the constitution because they know if they had done that, this wouldn't even be an argument we're having right now. This wouldn't be discussion because it would have been a protected sex would have protected class. And therefore they could never use, oh, well, it's not in the constitution because you know, women weren't really, they would have prevented that. But right now they've been trying to prevent that from happening because then it would give women the leverage to be able to say, I am protected in so many areas that areas that I that you can no longer try to manipulate my rights based on original makers of the Constitution who did not see women as whole persons. So when we're talking about this, I think it's important that we are thinking about how we get together and we come together on educating people about these ballot measures. I think it's extremely important right now. And I know Ray, I thought I saw Ray pop in. I know Ray is, in Georgia is really good about this making sure people understand fully what these ballot measures are saying, making sure they understand what the candidates' positions are, how their voting records have been in their states and their local, in the local communities. All that information is extremely important because this is where people slip through the cracks that, you know, I, you know, people don't really know. So they'll say, oh, okay, well, I don't know this person. They're, you know, they're better than this person. Or, you know, I'll just go ahead and pick somebody. Or I don't really fully understand it, so I'll leave it blank. We don't want anyone leaving anything blank, right? We don't want anybody to walk out of a, walk away from their, their voting ballot and feel that they don't understand it because it was not explained to them. We have to stop making the assumption that everybody understands the ballot, that everybody understands the election process, that everybody understands the voting process, that everybody understands what candidates' positions mean and what they say. We need to talk to our communities like we would talk to them at the kitchen table. I'm passing it back over to Wendy. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, and it's, I mean, you're covering the whole spectrum. So many great points. Um, so yeah, you, um, you mentioned, uh, you know, human value. And I think that that's a, a huge point of it where um, we just, as a society, we need to start having greater value for humanity in, in all aspects. And I think a lot of our ideals will start to come to fruition once we give that credit. And, um, and I, I, I do agree um, with ju just like with what you do is so important and with Ray and everybody, because you mentioned um, people understanding and then the tricks that they pull, like I'm in Florida. And I've seen the tricks with um, the ballot amendments where, you know, things like really amazing amendments have gotten pulled off because um, it's for, uh, uh, semantics. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the one thing that we lack in Florida is really like great organizing and, and we're just up against such a corrupt force. And a lot of it is empowering people where they just need a great leader, like someone like you where they're um, actually um, providing the information and have the infrastructure there because the, you know they they they'll activate once there's someone showing them the way and and including them you know and there's there's a lot where um you know I, I always encourage people to go into um communities that they don't normally venture out and 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 to cross those bridges because I mean that's the one thing that the opposition fears is unity mm -hmm. and I think um the more people that are are, are oppressed like the more they want to resist and the more they want to come together, even in the sense of like, you know, the enemy of my enemy or the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, I think is what they say. <laughs> so um, I think that there's a lot of um, opposite reaction happening. Like there was all those protests that happened this weekend. And I was seeing how there's a lot more women, um, especially women of color, black women, Latina um, and Asian Pacific women are running for like governor's offices and state houses. And, and that's, um, incredibly important to, to not only just vote, but to actually take the role of em empowering themselves because that's the only time people, like regular people get into politics is when they feel like they're just, they have to. So um, I'm trying to stay positive about this moment and to galvanize it um, because sometimes it's like when things stay the same and have momentum, the status quo has momentum for so long and that's when it solidifies. And sometimes things just have to get worse in order to get better. So um, I'll bounce it back to Christian. She's 
wonderful with everything she said. Yeah, no, Wendy, you're saying so many um, great things. I mean, I'm just like, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we're, we're synergy, we have synergy, we have synergy over saying, um, yeah. but it, it's, it's very true. Exactly what you're saying is when people get the status quo and, and then people getting, you know, they need to be agitated, right? Right now, people need to be agitated. We all need to be agitated to where we're not comfortable. It's not acceptable for us anymore. And, and I'm going to say something and, you know, hey, I may not, I, but I want to say it because I think it's important to say is <laughs> what we saw happen with why Trump got elected. And this is, this is not saying, this is the truth of what happened in elections is that a lot of white women showed up for Trump, right? Um, and they showed up because they felt like they aligned with Trump's messaging on some points, some issues he had, right? Okay. But now that Roe was being overturned, now they're seeing how it affects them and, and I, in their lives and their families' lives. Now that issue has, rev, has resonated with them. And so I think that we need to be aware of how important it is talking about issue-based practices and issue-based organizing and how effective that can be because that's what's happening right now. And because of that, we're able to let people see that this is not about political part affiliation. This is not about parties. This is about issues. And now we're able to tell people Roe <laughs> is impacting everyone regarding a, with how you identify your political party. And Roe will cause an effect on your lives as well. And Trump can't help you. <laughs> MAGA can't help you. And no one's going to help you. If anything, they're creating this and causing it. Right. So I think we have to really think about that is how when we focus our organizing and our education activism, make sure to focus on the issues. And let's sometimes I think we get so wrapped up in, um, you know, our, you know, our, our, our parties that we can lose track on everyday people want to talk about what's impacting their daily lives. How does it impact me every single day? And we need to do that. We need to go back to that. I'm a social worker. Right. So social workers say me a person where they're at. And we need to meet these our, our communities and the voters where they're at and find out what issues are, how the issues are infecting them. And that's why we're seeing the women, the, the, the voter drive up. That's why we're seeing them turn off these bad level initiatives. And that's why we have the possibility to actually win the Senate. We really do. They're, that's what they're polling. It looks like we have a possibility to do it. So I think that we have to think about as we continue to go out and we continue organizing or pushing the vote, we push why we're choosing these candidates. Yes, they're progressive, but they're progressive because they believe that you have a right to have be whole and you have a right to, you know, you have a right to have make a choice for your own self and have, you know, reproductive freedom and liberty. And you have a right to marry who you want to marry and you have a right to love who you want to love and you have a right to have safe safety and housing and these different issues, we have to push back the issues and everyone and let them know how they are connected to the issue and the values of why they need to vote for the candidates for pushing and why they need to vote for certain ballot measures and why these things directly impact their lives. We need to be the connecting dot in our organizing to help people fully understand it. I, I, thank you so much. Yeah, and I'm, I'm so excited to respond and to, to piggyback on that because you're actually speaking um, directly in my heart. And um, yeah, it, and that was a point that I was um, forgetting too, is that, you know, you think like libertarians would be all about, you know, stay out of my business, you know, and I'll, just anecdotally, um, I, you're like really, really um, speaking to something that I, I've actually experimented, like, um, just anecdotally, like I have, because of the, the water crisis in Fort Lauderdale, I had started a community forum that now has 520 people on it and it's completely nonpartisan. And I make sure that it's issue-based. And I will tell you, like from my experience, three years of experience with this, you can come together over issues. And there's two issues that will bring people together is environment and government overreach. It, people mm -hmm. need clean water and they need the government to not be authoritarian, period. And anybody, and if you take the time to like, respect that humanity in somebody else that you want for yourself, mm -hmm. then they will meet you where you're at and, and you can negotiate on that. I think a lot of the rise of Trump was that the left and this whole cancel culture had just pushed people so far out of the fringes that they just were so against like feeling, you know, a, 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 not a part of the system anymore. And so it's like when you can sit down with somebody, regardless on how you might feel about their stance on anything else and climate war, whatever. But if you can come together over a specific issue and respect the humanity in this person, 
you might even make inroads into listening and, and finding compromises in those other areas just by making that human connection and saying, all right, let's find where we can agree instead of focusing on where we disagree. And I'll tell you, conservatives like really are concerned about just having their own autonomy over themselves once you can break past that point. And one other quick thing that I found on um, a statistic was it was showing that a lot of um, conservatives that were running, regardless of what they'll actually do in office, Right now, their campaigns are backing off the um, the pro-life um, and the, the anti-abortion um, rhetoric and their campaigns and their websites are having to become more moderate because they know that I think it was like 60 percent of Americans. I think it was the uh, Wall Street Journal did a, a study that 60 percent of Americans are for um pro-choice, like at least to some extent, with some extension. I mean, we're, we're looking at- Yeah, Pew like, Research did the same study as well. It was like 61%, I think Pew Research had as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. And and um, just uh, like going back to what Christian um, brought up, like introduced us with, I'm gonna give it back to her, is that, um, I mean, we're looking at like in DeSantis, like I'm in DeSantis land, right? And mm-hmm. like, they're saying that like rape, incest like it's gonna have to like it's gonna have to kill you in order for us to even consider us letting the doctor do their job right I mean that's just psychotic it really I mean so yeah I'll I'll give it back to you thanks Christian yeah no I I mean just exactly what you're saying and I think even too if we just look at other like studies and other research about just our rights and we talk about you know, the impact of these things so I know we're talking about women and like we're talking a lot about um what's in the ballot this this coming midterms. And I think we also can think about it being on the ballot for 2023 and 2024 as well, because there's also some states they're going to be introducing some measures um, in 2023. But I mean, this is such an intersectional issue. And, and I think when we, when we really get down to it, we have to pay attention to that. And like, and I think the, the conservatives you're saying as they're backing away, they're backing away because they're recognizing probably that that's not a winning point anymore for them. Um, some are some, but some it is, right? But because they're, they're different viewpoints and we know we have those different viewpoints, but it is about life, you know, because like a Turnways did a study, um, they did like a comprehensive multi-year study and they actually, uh, it was extra on abortion access and, and people keeping and, and, and pregnancy. And they examined the effects of unwanted pregnancies on women and children. So they actually just studied to see for those people who were like, because what we're facing right now is forced pregnancy, right? Um, and, they're, and they just study, this is before overturning a bro, a multi-year study. Um, and it said that anybody that was denied an abortion has almost a four times greater odds of having a lower income, household income that meets the federal poverty level and three times more likely to be unemployed. And so we're talking about these things. I want us to think about how this applies to economic justice. And I know Joel's here at the NCH and he has a lot of work with homelessness. And we're talking about these things. So we start crossing over so many different intersections of oppression when we get into what we're really fighting for as well. Because how can we be really trying to save lives or how can we really be trying to... Um, you know, I guess elevate, that's what I'm yeah, like yeah. elevate the yeah. society, right? Elevate the society. If yeah. with the things we're doing, like you pointed out earlier, we're not fighting for equal pay or in, you know ending the gender wage gap, and we're not fighting for medical, you know, family medical leave uh, for all and paid family medical leave. I should say we're not fighting for pregnancy workers fairness act, and we're not fighting for a universal child care, universal health care, Medicare, like. The fact that we know forcing pregnancy is only going to create more barriers and more poverty for so many people, and it's going to affect children and their ability to get homes and be unemployed. And you're already talking about are we even pushing one fair wage, you know? And we're having people who are going to be forced to essentially choose, you know, how do they survive when they take up time for a baby and they don't have and they don't have paid family medical leave act. I mean, it takes people, a long time. I have a three-year-old. I still remember how long it takes me to recover from the three-year-old, right? Um, you know, and it takes quite a bit of time to be able to have your body to place to be able to be functioning. And if you have other children you're caring for, um, you know, and this is in, in you're not making minimum wage or you're making lower than minimum wage or you're a tip worker or you're an undocumented worker or so many other factors that go into place with this. 
we're now getting to the area of you know of increasing and in, increasing the economic injustice, and then because we're forcing people to be pregnant that they don't want to. And this is a huge problem. And I and I see that we're talking a lot about Trump in the in the, um, in, the uh, in the chat. And I, I just want to say that the reality is, statistics did say that a lot of women did show up for him, more showed up for him, and that contributed to his win. And do I have the exact statistic number correct? I don't, but I do know I read lots of research and a lot of you know information on it, and I probably could find it and bring it in and share it with Mike later on. But the reality of it is, is that what we need to do is we need to start voting on issues. And that's our point, Wendy and I, I think are trying to stress is that we should be issue-based in our voting and we need to come together collectively um, and figure out how are we going to save, and I, I just say, save the democracy that we have and didn't reconstructure it, right? <laughs> because the democracy we have right now is not effectively helping everyone. So the, we need to say that everyone still has a collective power of people. We still need to do some restructuring because how it's set up right now is not benefiting majority. And that's a problem. So okay. we need to work on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I could listen to you like speak like you're just so like, yes, yes, energy. I love it. Um, We have a couple of hands up, but I just really, really um quickly want to um just respond to a couple of things that um you had said there was um there's also a study done like years ago. It was right after um Roe happened. Right. And there are, it was 15 years after um, like the abortions were allowed again. And they noticed that crime rates went down dramatically because you had less unwanted children around everywhere. And I just want to say on a personal note, like my mom was um, a secretary in foster care growing up and I would go to the office with her. And I would hang out with the foster care kids. And I just was like personally affected by that all growing up. And, you know, just one thing I have to say to challenge people, anyone who's like, you know, anti-abortion, um, are you planning on taking one of these kids out of foster care and, and caring for them and being their parent? Are, are you planning on playing that role? Because if not, like, I don't, I don't see how you have an opinion. That's how, that would be the one thing I have to say. Yeah. And from, from the time they are, from the time the, the person is pregnant and the mother's pregnant and has them, all the way until the child is 18. Not because I hear, I hear a lot of times they'll say, oh, we'll provide support. You can't just provide, provide support just for the time when they're pregnant. And then once the child is born, then disappear because that's what society has done for so many, right? If you're not willing to support them all the way up until their 18th birthday, when they become an adult <laughs> and prepare them in the, in, in, as through the support to be able to be able to function, then you're not really doing any service by trying to say you have this other option. You don't have the other option. And we know right now there are a lot of children that are aging out of foster care. Yep. Homeless. Homeless. Because yeah. they don't prepare them with the resources. Very yeah. few companies are out there. They're trying to prepare them with the transition resources yeah. and provide them. And then people just leaving them to like be like, well, here, just fit for yourself. And yeah. not till we have to fix. And that's about making something about life and making life sustainable and having equity for all. And I know we got to turn to questions because I know I have a yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, but it's, it's so wonderful to hear I could go on and on, but it's been great to have you in this space with me, Wendy. And we could open up some <laughs> questions. Um, I don't know what order they are in uh harvey so i think um i think cynthia papermaster is from um code pink and um we also have um mary um uh, yeah, cynthia mary and danette yeah so okay. thank you god we'll let um cynthia go ahead thank you so much christian we appreciate yeah, you thank you Wendy. come back again <laughs> cynthia you're muted honey unmute please i think mary had her hand up first Okay. Oh, okay, Mary, you want to go and then Cynthia you can go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, having three daughters in today's society that I find was going on uh, quite disappointing. It's uh, not like, I don't know why my camera shut off that I have no control over that. Um, because not Mary, like, we can we can hear you better when the video is off. You were cutting out. Oh, okay. So anyway, um, I would just like to say that, you know, it it's never really gone away. It Roe versus way is always, you know, I still have seen men force women to get abortions or to keep a child in our society. But now that this has happened, it's it's astronomically worse. 
And I wasn't aware if you knew this, but we need a fight, especially in Oklahoma, too, Mm -hmm. because over a year ago, they passed a law that if a woman was pregnant and her boyfriend or husband beat her and she loses the child, she's the one that's charged for murder, not the man that beat the woman. So women are been at being attacked for like the last five years across the board, across the United States. And it's sad that, you know, it's all it had to come to Roe versus Wade to fall for us to realize this. Mm-hmm. Barbara, yeah, and I, thank you. And isn't it also, and I think Oklahoma is also the, the state that has a full ban, a total ban as well. Um, and they, like you're seeing, Mary is trying to make it a, a murder or homicide. So, and some of these states are coming out with, I don't know what, um, if it is, is, I don't think it's Oklahoma, there's another state that's trying to come out with a death penalty, capital punishment, you know, life imprisonment type of charges for those who do it. And, you know, so I think we have to also look at that too. What is that really saying, you know? Yeah. And we didn't even mention um, the women that are going across the border, the dangerous abortions that are going to be having, like, we didn't even touch on that. So yeah. Okay. And, and I agree also what Mary's saying, it's been happening a long time. It's going to continue to happen. They're ma- making it less safer and that's a concern. So, all right. Um, I can't remember this. Just a quick yeah. reminder, everyone keep your comment or question under 90 seconds. We have a lot of people on staff. Thank you. Yeah, we will. And Cynthia is here from um, Code Pink. So we're excited to hear what she has to say. So we'll, yeah, we'll let you go ahead. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Yeah, I'm really thrilled to meet you, Christian. How do you pronounce your last name? Nunes. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you brought up the idea of issues and focusing on issues and issues really matter to people, not, not political party as much. And there's a big issue that's facing us right now, which is the threat of nuclear war. And I don't know if um, National Organization of Women looks at foreign policy at all or what the government is doing in in funding weapons and nuclear weapons. Um, But we're, we're trying to encourage women to take leadership to prevent a nuclear war. There's a lot of talk about it. I'm not taking sides in the Ukraine war right now. I just want the war to end. I want negotiations, et cetera. So I'd love to hear your response to that. Um, if you can j- just take a moment to do that. And thank you so much. Sure. Um, well, now it doesn't have a position on nuclear wars or on anything like that so far, but we do global feminism. So typically how we work is anything that can directly impact um, lines within our six, six core issues. Um, and it aligns with women, you know, then we typically can speak out on it. So I guess I would have to see um, from what angle, you know, um, we now would be able to speak on that. And, you know, I would love to get more information about you think, your position, but definitely for us, we have, we have six core issues we focus on and our work um, has to be in alignment with those six core issues. Um, and, you know, the things that fall under those six core issues, uh, but we do do global feminism work, yes. I don't know if that really answers the question, but. <laughs> and if there's any um, more women that are on the call that um, that want to uh, to present and ask any questions, um, please get on um, get on stack there and raise your hand. I see you have Jeffrey. Yeah. And and I um, really just really quickly on um, what what Cynthia just said is that um, and I just it reminds me of like Iran because we're trying to get you know proliferation over in Iran. And I bet if we supported the women there more, they would probably be less likely to want to go to war because we're the nurturers. You know, it's like minus like a small percentage of women, but it tended like I imagine if more women had political power and in the whole sphere, we would be less inclined to want to go to battle. Um, So I think uh, Danette, I guess, is is next on the chat. Thank you. You guys are awesome. Nice to see you, Christian. Yeah, Um, boys. I have a um, kind of a uh, across the aisle question. Um, there is a, a woman, there was a woman in, um, a, in Texas. She was a formerly uh, ant, very virulently anti-abortion until it affected her. She had a life-threatening pregnancy. She had to travel to New, Me- to New Mexico to save her life, basically, because, of course, you can't, you can't have an abortion in Texas anymore. How, and this brings me back to my point, 
um, that they only care about it when it affects them personally. How do you cross that divide with people that um, haven't been affected by it personally? Um, that is such a hard divide to cross. And like I said, Republicans don't give it a poop unless it has personally affected them. So that to me is like a huge hurdle to overcome. I don't know if we're addressing that at all. Thanks. Sure. Dwindy, you want to go for it? I'll, I'll let you go ahead with that one. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. And I, I totally agree with you on this, Jeanette, um, that that is a, that's a hard place because that's kind of what I was saying earlier. A lot of times once they become affected, they move over, right? But before they, before they are, like, how do we get them to understand the issues? But I think that's when it becomes about relationship and conversation building, right? And tapping into those groups that, um, who, who are seeing that and having conversations about and letting them know how it can affect them in different areas and naming things like, did you know in your state if you were to like have a medical issue and it could be any of these issues, they would consider that this and therefore you would put you in this. Also, one of the things I want to point out too that they don't people don't also know about, and I've been using this a lot, it's been really helping people understand. Is it also this these bands are also affecting people who have need cancer treatment, um, treatment for their rheumatoid arthritis and the lupus, because there are certain medications that they provide for those um, autoimmune diseases, chronic illnesses, and tr cancer treatments that have what they call abortifacent um, abilities. And, and they also, you know how medications they use med multiple medications for different issues. So um, they're starting to literally gender profile, right? Um, and prevent pharmacists to prescribe certain medications because they have the ability to, abort, the, to, to create an abortion if a person takes, they can use it to do a medical abortion is what they're calling it. So they're starting to do this. And I will, you know, and, and they are literally marking your medications up and they are, they're basically not prescribing them in some states at all. The pharmacists are told they can't prescribe them. Doctors are told they can't prescribe them. Pharmacies are putting holes on it. And this is how we start talking to people, let them know, like, what about if you knew somebody who had, you know, who were struggling with cancer? How would you feel if they couldn't get the treatment they needed? because of this ban. That's what, that wouldn't happen. Yes, it, it's happening. Yeah, and <laughs> it really it's, it's happening. And there's there's one other point, and that's an amazing, I didn't even think of that. Um, but one other thing that I think would cut straight through to any conservative would be like, well, you know, when the kid's born and there's no, they need social services and they need to go on welfare, your taxes are going to be paying for that. You know, if like, because money money speaks, but with the point that Christian just made is is outstanding. Thank you so much. I think- but Okay. And I and I agree too. It's it's like what we're talking about is hitting them on issues that make a, make um, um, are important to him, important to them, and matter to them. That's what we have to go. All these they're all intersectional. These all tie back in together. So what we do is we pull out the one that's going to impact them. So I'll talk about like like Wendy said about your taxes. Start talking about um, money, finances. Start talking about how it will maybe impact your communities. Things like this, I think, will be so, so, so important when we're doing our work that we focus on the person, we're bringing it back to the person and what directly impacts them. That moves beyond any partisan. And, and we're all con like connected as well. Right. Like we can always mm -hmm. find that connection. I, I don't want to get, I hate to cut you off, Christian, because it's nope. just amazing. But I know um, Hetty's got her hand up there and we have a bunch of people that are so excited to hear from you, Christian. So <laughs> thank you. So we're going to um, go to Hetty, but thanks so much, Kristen. And thanks for the, the question. Yeah. Hi, thank you for being here. Uh, this is Hetty Tripp from St. Cloud, Minnesota, and uh, formerly of the uh, National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum which is deeply into reproductive justice. But uh, this question, and I put it in the chat, is what I'm seeing on the ground here, that there are a number of very conservative women of color, particularly Asian uh, American women and African American women who are uh, really opposed to many of the values that you have been talking about that. And it makes it very difficult here uh, to, to um, you know, to, to fight them, let's say that, right? How do you deal with that, particularly women of color who are in the conservative arena? I know issues are important, but right. this is real. So um, 
I think this is a great point as well, because what's happening is that some of these bands are not only, as we talk about other ways of issues, are not only just talking about those who choose, you know, who are making the choice to have, you know, abortions. They're also trying to say that, you know, a top pregnancies and miscarriages are forms of abortion, right? And so if you, yeah, like a person can choose it, <laughs> like a person can choose those things for their body. Um, but if you, if you, ha- if you have, if those things happen to you and you were to go and try to get treatment, some places are holding treatment and, until they investigate it because they don't, they feel like they have to make sure it's not what they think it is and make sure you didn't intentionally try to do it yourself or, and people are dying in those communities that the same communities, you know, the, the, the Asian um, American Pacific Islander community, the, the black community, the black and brown community, especially the black and brown communities. And, and then, you know, people are dying for those treatments because they're not being able to get the basic treatments for our medical conditions when they should get medical care. Um, so I think it's having the conversations with them to let them know that this is not just about, it's about healthcare access to and how these bands will ask themselves to bring it back and say, well, what do you feel about the maternal mortality rate in, in our community? That's what I do. Like, what do you feel about the maternal mortality rate? You know, because a lot of it's religious based and, 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 and uh, you know, tr- traditionally, you know, a lot of uh, black and brown and people are very spiritual. <laughs> and so that's kind of where I think some of the conservative part comes from. But I bring it back and I say, you know, well, what do you feel about Black maternal mortality? And they'll tell me this is messed up. It's so rooted in racism or it's, you know, and I'll say, well, this is what's going to (laughs) happen if we don't have the option. And, you know, I always remind people this is about option and choice, too. This is not making, this is talking about people have a right to make a choice is really what we're talking about, that you have a right to choose. And And if you believe that for yourself, that is totally fine. That's not what this argument is about. The argument is about do women have a right to choose for themselves and for their and for their and for their personal autonomy and their personal privacy. These are the things we have to pull up the, the and pull up statistics about black maternal and the fact that if these bands continue, we're going to see increased rises in the black maternal mortality. We're going to see increased rises in incarceration in black and brown indigenous and, and persons of color because they feel that um, we intentionally try to do these things from, uh, un, you know, a, a talk of pregnancies and miscarriages. So I think it's just bringing it back to how it make them understand on different ways how it does. And some people are not going to win everybody also. And I think we have to understand that, but we definitely can start wrapping it back to them about the things that does impact them and what these things, these bands really do. Yeah, I, I would, I just want to say to you is um, Christian, hopefully we'll have you back. I would actually love to, um, do a segment, well, I, I don't wanna say I'd love to do it. Unfortunately, I think it's necessary that we do um, a segment on the mortality rates of black women compared to especially women or white women in, in hospitals. It's ridiculous. Like how many more black women suffer or die because of poor treatment in hospitals. And um, it's another issue. And I'm gonna um, jump to Lynn real quick because sorry, we're doing ladies first at the moment. If anybody wants to get on stack right now, it's your chance on um, 90 seconds on the questions, please. And I'll get to the guys after Lynn. Thanks so much. Thanks. For- and I have about a five more minutes, so I'll just need to point that out too. <laughs> I'm gonna have a hard stop, so. Uh, hi, um, I presume that you guys can hear me. Um, I just wanted to follow up on something that Christian said that I think is really at the heart of the matter. And that is that um, it, it's really about the effort to control society and the effort to force people to do what certain elements of the society want them to do and i think we need to keep our our eyes focused on that because it's really about democracy it's really uh, the heart of the matter is our um 10,000 year history of always having a scapegoat and a slave to make the money for us so that we can hoard it and the women who are being um, uh, recruited into the movement to make money for those who are controlling the society are now mostly white women. It's very easy for the society to scapegoat and get rid of people of color and women of color. 
They don't care if they sterilize Native American women. And that's a big issue that we should look at today mm -hmm. because it is Indigenous Peoples Day. Yes. And so I just want to I want to emphasize that it really all gets down to the system of whether we are going to be democratic or whether we are going to be ruled as an oligarchy, as Christian also mentioned. So thank you. Listen, Lynn just said it, y'all. <laughs> and she just brilliantly said that it comes down to always wanting to, who's going to be the one that's the worst enslaving and ruling? I mean, thank you, Lynn, for that. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Yep, me too. Thank you, Lynn. Brilliant. Nailed it right there. Yes, yes. The heart of the matter. All right. So Jeffrey, really quickly, buddy. Okay. Real quick question. And we got um, Justin, Eric, and um, Marshall. We have um, Mary, but since Mary already went, I'm going to go to the guys and then um, that's it, guys. Then we got, she's got five minutes. So please respectful to everybody with questions. Thank you. Can you hear me first off? Yes, quickly, please. All, Thank all you. right. I'm gonna, all right. I got two questions. I'm going to try, I'm going to say, tell them to you really quickly since we got, since I only got 90 seconds. First off, are these anti abortion extremists not concerned with their, with people's lives at all? For instance, who gets raped and whether they die during childbirth, even if it, even if they are their own children, like their own. And secondly, I don't know if this will make a different difference, but uh, do you think having a female, pre, the first female president could, uh, could actually help out, help out or not, or not? Do you want to answer, Wendy? Uh, um, thank you real quickly, and I'll divert back to you. I think, um, yeah, I think depending on the woman, I think um, it definitely would help. Um, but yeah, I think that um, the rich and the powerful will always find ways to get what they need. And it doesn't matter, like, you know, it's what's good for them isn't necessarily what's good for everybody else. And I'll, I'll yield back to Christian. Thank you. Else? Yeah, the first thing I would just remind you of the case in, um, in Indiana with a 10 year old little girl who was raped since the age of nine, who became pregnant by the 27 year old pedophile rapist. And they had to leave and um, the state in order for her to, now we know, that, that, I don't know if everyone really knows, but children's bodies are not meant to have, to give, to, to have carry and have baby and the, the, the damage it could do. And they, that child had to literally live. But, but before that, there were statements made by legislators who said, you know, I don't know if this is her case, but it was another case. Someone said, um, a legislator said, well, you need to try to figure out the blessing in your rape and your incest. There have been legislators who said those comments. So to that, I just say they don't care. And I think we keep going back to they're not seeing women as valued and whole and human. And that's what we're fighting against. Mm -hmm. We're fighting for the, our ability to be seen as whole and valued human and have our full rights that we deserve and we're owed. Um, and then second part, I think that it depends on what type of president, <laughs> right? It depends on the values of the president, if it's a woman, because you see what's happening over in UK. Um, and was it uh, with a new prime minister over there? I forgot what her name is. Um, uh, I forgot, but she's pushing all kinds of anti-trans, anti-homophobic, um, uh she's pushing a whole bunch of hate rhetoric thank you italy italy thank you yes okay. and she's name pushing... is, uh, maggie thatcher jr <laughs> that's what i was thinking harvey is like yeah and she war. thank you for coming i wasn't sure where she was where what country she's from but this trust that's her name yes and she's pushing so much hate and disgust so, and, and, and we know there are, and that's what Lynn pointed out early, that there are women put in place to, to disguise the messaging to yeah. eat so. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much okay. more I could say to that, but we're, since we're, we're pressed for time and you, you really said, you said everything, Christian. Thank you. Um, we'll go to Justin really quick, Eric, really quick, um, Marshall and um, Mary. And I think that's if we, if there's time for anything yeah, else. I'm a, I got about, yeah, I can give you guys about five more minutes and then thank you drop. so much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you guys call on me? I had an, was interrupted by something. This is Justin. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I, I wanted to take an approach of uh, cultural cross connection, right? So a lot of people will change their minds only if you use the words or, uh, you know, phrasings that they're used to. So a, a lot of these, um, this rhetoric for anti-abortion uh, comes out of 
uh, the New Apostolic Reformation, but generally, you know, Christian theology. And the problem is that while they claim that they are for things like states' rights and federalized government and so on and so forth, what's actually going on here is they're not uh, letting those systems work, right? Even the faith community is being undermined because you're not saying that the... Just to answer your question, honey, I'm sorry. We have, she only has a couple of minutes. We have a long right, so list of people. Thank the, you. Right. So we're, we're not letting the doctor decide. We're not letting the uh, family decide. We're not letting the pastor or priest uh, and, the, and the community of support decide. No, we're making a universal decree. That's authoritarian. That's not liberty and freedom. So yes. Yes. Yeah. So, okay, thank you. So, thank you. That was it. all right. So, um, Eric, do you have a question for us? Please? Thank really you. quick. Um, there's the two podcasts on um, uh, Words to Win by by Anat Shankar Osorio, one on how Ireland won reproductive um, um, freedom, and the other about um, how um, Argentina did. Are you, are you a fan of the, of the techniques? Have you had a chance to look at them? Um, words to win by by Anat Shankar Osorio. I think they're very exciting. I'm her. Um, I haven't, but I'll look into reading about that. I haven't read it. So, but thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Eric. Um, Marshall. Marshall, are you there? Are you unmuted? On please. Thank you. There. Okay, thanks. I tried on you, but I needed you. Um, I do have a question. Um, um, it's related to the front, one of the big stories in today's Washington Post, which points out that um, Catholic hospitals control one in seven patients in the country. And of course, we've known that for a long time that they did not provide abortion services. And it's on their website I, of the of uh, Dignity Health, which runs a lot of hospitals in my area in Northern California. So how do we deal with that? Even the progressives don't recognize that the hospitals that they all go to here have that policy. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And I, I think that's something that I think we still have to figure out because like you're seeing a majority of those, these medical systems are Catholic and not only do they not provide that abortion? But they don't even want to provide like um, pre-prevention care or preventative care, like um, tubal ligations or anything like that, or certain types of birth control that are permanent. So, and I think also to point out too that there are states also too that are trying to make an attack now on, on, on birth control. So they don't want to. They're starting to try to outlaw that as well. So, <laughs> you know, don't don't. Don't get pregnant because you'd be forced to get pregnant, but also don't protect yourself from getting pregnant. So because we'll make that out, out loud too, which is just nonsense and it's, this, this makes no sense. So I think we have to continue to work on our strategies for that um, and work with healthcare providers and policymakers and funders and everyone involved in the in the position of how we can combat that on the healthcare level, on the systems level, um, because majority of are controlled. And I, and I don't think that anyone really is thinking clearly all the way through about that either. Yeah, it's, it's definitely you. unifying over um, the consequences of things. And I'm going to call on um, Mary, but before you go, Christian, I hope you put in, at least put in the chat and share how we can support your work yeah. and, and anything that we can do. And um, so then Mary, and then um, we'll move on and we'll, we'll let you go, Christian. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. If there's anything else you want to add after, of course, as well. Mary, go ahead. Can you unmute for, you, for us, please? Yeah, um, I just wanted to offer my services to our uh, special guest here. Um, I would love to speak if she needed an inspirational female for other women out there. Seems how I was raised in servitude, uh, taught myself to read and write, never went to school until I was uh, 13 years old. Um, when I was left on my own at 17, I put myself in school, graduated when I was 18, and in 1983 was the youngest female general contracting foreman at 18 years old, and with no real prior education, came back to Spokane, Washington, and walked away with a 3.2 and a 3.8 GPA, and, and considered one of the world's leading authorities in building code reform, and uh, 
eliminating slums from ever being built again. That's one of my major plights in life is to work on that. So if you ever wanted somebody to be inspirational out there and to guest speak to inspire the next generation of females to stand up for the rights, who better than a gal that was a foreman the same time women were starving themselves for equality back in 1983? Well, send drop your information at now.now.org. That's our overall email about address because we have conferences every year, annual conference. We're always looking for speakers. So, Christian, it's been um, such a, such an amazing experience um, being able to speak with you and brainstorm on this, and um, really would love to have you back. So please, and and you're welcome anytime, of course, to, to sit in with us. But I would definitely love to revisit the um, the mortality rates that we were speaking of, and just you make so many wonderful points. You're so articulate, so thoughtful, and just do such amazing work. So um, again, if, if yeah, I'll let you close out with anything else you want to add at all. Thank well, you. Well, it has been a pleasure, actually, Wendy, like tag teaming. <laughs> oh my goodness. It has been so much fun. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Thank you, PDA so, and um, and uh, Harvey great. and Greep. And I, I know, I know, I'm getting to it. I know y'all's names. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, come, you come back. You please yeah. come back. We'll have you back anytime. Yeah, but thank you. It's been a pleasure to, to join and um, definitely, um, you know, any way we can be helpful, um, I just encourage everyone to just get out there and make sure you're just making sure people you know and care about know what they need to know. Um, that's the first step. And, and you're prepared as well. And uh, any way we can be helpful, but definitely the vote counts, your voice counts, you're worthy, you're a whole. And thank you for joining us and me and uh, Wendy and I today. And uh, love it. Love to do it again. Well, you're a great, you're a great team. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so Wendy. Much. Christian, we, we want you back. Anytime you want to come back, please do. I will. All right. So I'm, I'm going to sign off now. This is, and we're going to start a new tape. This has been the great Christian Nunez with a, a Wendy Wendy Lieberman, equally great, and a wonderful hour on women's issues and the, and the impact. Uh, uh, of the abortion issue on, on the election. Thank you, PDA. Uh, thank you, um, Progressive Radio Network, um, uh, for listening in. We'll be back next week at Progressive Radio Network. For those of you still on, we're gonna, we have 70 people. We're going to continue now. We're going to break the tape and continue on to discuss energy and solar. Was there an Adam? Was there an Eve? Did we evolve from what we conceived? Either way, we got what 